C'est le gars Je te vois pas. Oui, je suis là. Ah, sur la question. Il y a deux délégués. Okay, so we'll be starting. Um, this is the LP1 working group. So if you're looking for IPv6 over 747, you're in the wrong room. And um, so uh, the, our code chair, Alex, will not be with us today. But we, we have Laurent Toutain sitting here. So thank you, Laurent, for uh, being with us today and help us during this meeting. And uh, with this, we will start the introduction. So please, please, uh, before I take this screen off, please go and scan this, this uh, Q, Q bar, um code. So you, you'll be logged into the um, thing client for this session. And with this, let me start sharing material. On the foot? <laughs> oh, I'm in the wrong room. Man, sorry. Oops, sorry, I was logged in the wrong session. So we basically, while I'm logging in the right session, um, we have an agenda for 90 minutes, which is what we asked for. Now we were given a two hour session. So we have a half hour uh, free time, but uh, I really intend that we use that free time to do um, real work. And we have effectively a number of good questions on the table. So we'll, once we will be discussing the architecture document, I really hope that we can uh, go into details and um, move forward with, with the design that, that we want for LP1s. So then again, sorry, I need to log on the right thing. And I will start. Normally, this should be displayed automatically by them. That's what I don't understand. Because I was told that 15 minutes before the meeting, they, they would start. But if you don't mind, yes, go ahead. <clears throat> Okay, so if you can, there is the, no, I should be with. Um, that's a good question. Do we have a scribe? I mean, we get less and less scribes. So maybe Anna, if, if you're online, uh, if you could try taking some minutes, otherwise we'll do what the other ones do, which is take the, the, the Yeah, but I understand. I mean, Yorgos, can you take some, some minutes, please? Well, whatever you can. I mean, anyway, we have the recording of that and, and the details will go through. Sorry? I can take minutes, too. Well, that's nice. Thank you so much. OK, and uh, with this, can you display the main slides? There we go. So maybe if you don't mind, I will, I will be at the mic, and I will ask you to move them up. OK. 
So uh, as usual, we have the IETF not well. Now you'll find that the not well, well, not this slide, but there is a next slide. So uh, I expect that you know the not well very well. You're aware about the best practices in terms of IPR. You have to announce IPR, blah, blah, blah. If you're not fully aware of these, then please review the slides and uh, talk to the chairs or to the group if there is something that's being discussed for which you are aware of IPR. Now, the IETF these days insists also a lot on the code, code of conduit, meaning that we need to behave in those rooms. And we don't take for granted that we behave well because we never know really that we are not misbehaving. So, so the, 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 the ATF really strives, really pushes for improving the behavior between members of the ATF. So we, we don't do any form of harassment and we, we speak equal to equal and we give everybody a chance to speak even if he's not a native speaker, etc. So please consider this not well. And if you think that you're witness or participating to a harassment situation, please raise your hand or contact the Ombuds team. They are here to help you. Okay, so usual meeting tips. The, the, the one thing I ask from the people in this room is effectively to scan this QR code here on the screen and uh, make sure that you participate to the session. So that there is a new thing that we're trying now is to circulate a blue sheet like we did Earlier, so the blue sheet is in this table here, if you don't mind circulating. What it is, is really this code. So just to make sure that people are used to see this blue sheet, they scan the QR code as opposed to just scanning the one on screen. It's the exact same thing. The end, the end result is please be uh, part of the blue sheets by uh, joining the, the, the light client session. Next slide, please. Okay, and this is the agenda, the resources for, for this IETF. Next slide. Okay, so like I said, we built the agenda for our requested 90 minutes. We got two hours. And my goal, as usual, is not that we present. I changed this, this draft and I did this line, blah, blah, blah. Everybody sleeps to death. Uh, the goal in this meeting is to discuss issues. And guess what? We have a number of new interesting subjects to discuss since we are enough in this room, and then I see that there are a good number of people logged in. If you are remote, please raise your hand. You have equal rights to speak as the guy in this room. Everybody who wants to go to this mic has to raise his hand on the online tool. So we are on equal ground with the people who could not be on site. So we'll, we'll be serving the, the request in the order at which they come. So then again, remote participants, please raise your hand and, and ask your questions as if you were in the room. So we'll be talking about the future of the Chic working group and, and how the evolution goes from uh, LP1 to Chic. We'll be talking about the new RFCs that have been uh, published and the uh, documents that were adopted. And we'll be talking as a general purpose, since we don't have a draft for it, and Bob is here with us, to, to discuss about the pro progress we will make on the uh, IP protocol number on ESR type. This is happening in the interior working group. Then we'll have Laurent. Oops, I'm not sure. I'll go back. Yeah. So we'll have Laurent uh, reintroducing the OAM work. This is work that uh, started uh, in the LP1 working group and which will now continue in Chic working group. It has to do with proxy operations. So you don't have to go all the way to the device. If this device is, for instance, a sleeping device that cannot respond to ICMP by itself, or if it's really a low power device over LoRa or something like that, where you even want to save the bandwidth to go to it. So it could be sleeping and there is bandwidth, or it could be just across a very expensive bandwidth. Either way, there is a need for some kind of proxy uh, front end for it, which we'll answer on behalf. Then we'll, we'll have Marco. Marco, you're here. Um, uh, talking about the update of uh, 88.24. So that's the RFC about chic or uh, co-op over chic. So how, how you compress co-op. So you can, chic is a very generic uh, system. So you could always compress pretty much everything. And probably this group will be very interested in having a document which is really the, the, the chic for all. But if you do chic for all, you don't really optimize for what you're doing. On the other hand, if you do a more specific chic for this, then you get a better and more common a set of rules for that this. That's why we have chic for IP and chic for co-op, right? 
because those were very used and, and uh, well, the, the basically the, the basic protocols that we expect to see for IPv6 in, in LP1s as we knew them. So that's why we have those and we, we want to, to basically fix HCA24 based on real world experience to, to, to have a, a V2 kind of. So that's what Marco is doing for us. Uh, next slide, please. Then we'll have uh, Ivan uh, on the chic access control. So that's basically um, how do you authorize manipulating the fields in, in the rules? I mean, who can do what? That's basically the discussion. Then we'll have um, two sessions about the architecture. So I'm, I made them split, but it's really gonna, going to be a single session. We'll be discussing how we uh, initiate a chic session on a generic network. In LP1, everything was implicit because it was a point-to-point -point radio connection like LoRa or Sigfox. But now we want to extend that over the internet. So we really need to establish a form of tunnel and a form of session uh, between the endpoints. And we need to identify that resource to the endpoint so they can start compressing and decompressing. So what kind of information do you need to negotiate as you start this session? And what kind of header do you need in the packet? And uh, last but not least, we'll have uh, Daniel presenting uh, his work on DITE ESP, for which we actually uh, spent two days already and more because uh, Laurent continued to work on it after the hackathon. So uh, maybe, Laurent, you, you'll talk to us about what we tried at the hackathon about this draft. That was our subject for the hackathon. And that's pretty much it. Next slide, please. And then again, uh, the, the, the times were given as a reference, but we have a half hour that we'll be playing with. So we will not be uh, blocking you at the end of your slots, mostly if there are interesting discussions and et cetera, because that's really what we want to steer in this, uh, in this group. So first thing, LP1. So we are still a LP1 working group. Um, so the status of the LP1 working group is like yesterday. We published 8441 and 8442, which are basically um, the result of the work that was done in the context of Sigfox, but 41 is really more general. It's the compound hack. It's really more general than just uh, Sigfox. So we made it a separate uh, generic document, whereas 42 is really Sigfox. Now, the only document that was left is the architecture, and the architecture moved to Schick. So, so as we move the LP1 architecture into a chic architecture, you realize that the content uh, increases because now we, we are not only considering a point-to-point -point connection, we are considering the chic header, we are considering the session establishment, we are considering how do you locate and trust the rules that you're going to use for this session. So that's why the, the architecture is, is growing quite a bit and that's why we will have a session on it today. Next slide, please. So the smooth transition that you saw for those slides is exactly what's going to happen with this working group. We are smoothly transitioning from LP1 into SHIC. So my expectation is, unless there is opposition for that, but my expectation is that we will be closing SHIC with 8441, 8442. I'm sorry, we'll be closing LP1. I see Eric. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, so we'll, we'll be closing LP1, which really did its job and did it well and concludes with these this new RFCs. And we are moving the work onto Chic to make it more general for the general internet. We have uh, adopted a new working group, which is a new working group document, which is Chic over PPP. Document is useful in that sentence, uh, which is Chic over PPP. Uh, we got an OAM move from LP1, as I said. And we've got uh, new drafts. So Sergio is, I uh, started a convergence document, which is about a shake, which will be more abstract to the particular uh, lower layer technology. And uh, what he told us is that um, he intends to, to split this document into a convergence profile and a unified chic header. Now we are also working on a chic header and that's part of our uh, charter. So we'll, we'll see Effectively, we need that chicken our document and we'll see how we, we package all this. Um, and then there is the, the streaming mode that won't be discussed much today. There is no advancement there, no change. Sergio says that he, he, he wants to progress it, but it has not changed recently. Next slide. Okay, so 
victory, right? LP1 has done a great job. Um, I mean, the, the chairs, I'm representing Alex here, and I expect Eric. Thank you all very much for the great work that happened. We, we achieved our milestones. We, but the ones that are transferred to Chic because now they are more general, like in the architecture. Um, so we can claim victory. I think we did real good. Indeed, I just simply reviewing the LP1 for a while, AD. So thank you everyone for doing this. Um, it was a nice idea. Thank you, Pascal. Thank you, Alexa. Thank you, Laurent. Thank you, everyone there. Um, you will see the LP1 being close to there tomorrow. Right, when I have time. So somehow we don't applause at the ATF usually, but thank you for the job. Yeah, thank you. And it will be even more chic now. Well, yeah, yes, again, right? There was a transition logo, but now we need to, to ask Anna to do something for us. Okay, next slide. So, so a quick reminder that uh, Chic is not an island, right? We, we still, an example of that is the IP uh, protocol and, and the Ether type. We, we still work in, in coordination with the other working groups, in particular Interia, but not only Interia. And so this is actually a little snippet and excerpt from our charter. So, next slide. Okay, and we already have the status because we started. So, so these are the initial milestones. We've got many of them. And the first two milestones are actually completed. We have uh, adopted the, the architecture and the shake over PPP, and we are actively working on them. And uh, the next adoption is um, within the next, like I would say, three days. We might miss it. The adoption of the OAM work. So um, basically, Laurent, you will have a slot on OEM, and please tell us where we are uh, versus this adoption time. Next slide. And you see that, oh, sorry, come back. You see that the, the fourth uh, step is the generic chic header. So we have, we have a milestone for it. That will be a huge discussion at the architecture level right now. But once the architecture is kind of clear of what we, why we want a chic header and what kind of information we want in it, then we need a separate document which will describe the chic header and how it's being processed. And that will be a, a big discussion for today. Next slide. And just a, a quick reminder, we mentioned that at some interims, but for those who could not attend the interims, Chic is already um, successful around the world. Chic has been uh, adopted uh, as part of a, an IEC standard, and it's already included in LoRa 1. So, I mean, maybe Laurent, if you want to say something about that, you know better than I do about LoRa 1, what's happening for Chic. Usually it's Alex, do, Alex yeah. doing this speech because he, he loves it, but. If you have anything to say about Laura one? Mm, not not some, not something new. We so there is a TS10 that include in Laura one the chic technology, and it's uh, something that say you have to use uh, the RFC. I don't remember an 81 something, but is the Laura one over chic that has been defined at uh, the ATF, and also Laura one provides some test suite to verify that the conformance of the implementation of IPv6 over LoRa1. Okay, actually, since you're talking, I guess it's your time now. Okay, so we have to usually present, or I can push the slides and use it from my computer. Okay, we'll do it from your computer. Okay, so I will talk about uh, uh, old draft, but last for many, many years in, in the queue, but we are making it uh, revived uh, this, uh, this year. So it's uh, IOM for Chic. So in fact, it's mainly how to deal with ICMP in uh, a constraint environment, not only a constraint environment, but mainly focusing on uh, constraint environment. And this draft, of course, for generic purpose, define how to compress ICMP messages, but introduce also a list of new features that could be interested in, in a constrained environment where we have to protect the, the bandwidth. So there is, we have different uh, cases where we are dealing with uh, uh, ICMP messages. So next slide, please. What's up? Uh, okay, so 
we target on what is defined on RFC 4433, so compression of IPv6, uh, IPv6 message, uh, ICMPv6 messages. And as I say, we introduce new features for SHIC that could be interesting, that are interesting for ICMP, but can be generalized for other uh, purpose. So the first one, as Pascal say, it's a proxy that allow to answer to the ping messages instead of asking the device to do it. So this way we protect the bandwidth. So we, uh, there is also uh, ICMP generation. It means that the, IP, uh, the chic core can also generate some ICMP messages to say that there is an error. I don't find this rule or I cannot join this device. So we can have ICMP message to inform a regular device on the internet that the, the device cannot be joined. And we introduce also, um, so the device can also receive some IP, ICMP message from the internet to tell that there is a problem when sending information. And this is a way, for example, to reduce the sending rate because the device will know that uh, its, its message are, are lost. So for that, we introduce also new matching, uh, matching operator and new CDA to compress also the ICMP payload. So all these things have been tested. We have implemented it in OpenSheek and it, it works fine. So next slide, please. So I will go in, uh, uh, I will explain this uh, different scenario. So the first one is um, the case where you have a device uh, that send packets. So it's uh, the wave uh, line on the top. So you have the chic packet and this chic packet activate a live timer on the uh, chic core or the core chic. And this way, if an ICMP requ echo request is sent, then the core chic will intercept this message and will answer on behalf of the device to say I am alive. And when this timer expire, so if the core chic receive an ICMP echo request, then it will not answer. So this is useful in some case, for example, where you have Nagios and you want to test if all your devices are active. So you can use it regularly, send pings to see if the device is active and you can detect easily if a device is not active. So the question by you? Did you think about sending, an, in the, la, the latter case, right, the second case, to send an error message with a new code telling timeout or something like that? It would be more descriptive. So that, that's a, a good question. So in the, what we, all the, we didn't want, but we can discuss about that, to generate new ICMP codes to make, to make the not obvious that the device is on LP1 network. But so, it's not so much about code in this mm. case, it's more an like error code, right? Mm. Um, TTL expired, well, op limit expired, mm. this is unreachable and this kind of thing. So it's not a new type really, mm. but we, very similar. It, yes, it can be linked with what we will present after where we generate error code. So that's, okay, that's a possibility, yes. So pa pa Pascal also uh, during interim meetings Ask, for example, in the latter case, for example, if we don't have an answer, then we can also send the ICMP message to the device to be sure if the device is, uh, is cor correct or not. So to do that, we introduce a new element in the rule, and this is what we call an action. And the action will say, for example, here, ping proxy. So it means that when you receive an ICMP message and it matches, Instead of trying to compress it, you send it to an action and the action in that case will generate an answer. But we can have also uh, other kind of answer. Eric, you're still in the queue or it's... Uh, uh... <laughs> okay, so that's uh, for the ping compression or proxy. So the next feature we, we introduce is uh, allowing the device to uh, get an information from the network telling that there is a problem. So the device is sending a, uh, a chic uh, compressed ICMP message, uh, IPv6 message, sorry. So it is decompressed by the core chic and this packet cannot reach the destination for any reason. 
So in that case, an ICMPv6 message will be generated by an intermediary router or the last uh, uh, host. And here, you so the ICMP message arrives to the core chic. And if you have a rule to handle it, then we can send this information to uh, the device to tell that there is a problem. And it's, ne it's not necessary to continue to send at uh, this rate the information. What we introduce also is the fact that the ICMP message contains the IPv6 original message that triggers the error. So we introduce uh, two elements, what is called a um, uh, match rule and match reverse rule. So in that case, it match reverse rule, which means that I take the payload and I try to apply a rule that exists for this device and reverse because here it's not, uh, it's not downstream, it's upstream. So I do in the opposite direction. We also put match rule. We don't care here, but it can be useful, for example, uh, so it's a nice case where we can see that we can embed some chic message in another chic message. So we can also add two layers of compression using this. And in uh, complementary to the matching operator, we have two CDA that say I'm sending the compressed version of the message or I send a, a compressed version but using the reverse direction. So that's a way to uh, to inform the device and uh, we have some example in the draft where, for example, we just send a rule ID and this rule ID will tell there is a problem. So the device is informed that it cannot send the information. The last uh, element we uh, introduce is to, uh, allowing the core chic to introduce some ICMP error messages. So uh, here we didn't want to change or add new value to ICMP. It, it can be possible, we have to, to discuss here. But for example, what we say that if we don't find the device in, so in the context or the, the number of contexts you have in a core chic, so you cannot identify the device. So you send a device not found. So you send a type zero and a code three, host not found. And if you find the host, but you don't find an appropriate rel, uh, rule and there is no, no compression rule, so in that case, you say port not found, even if it's not the port, but it's a way to indicate. We can do something uh, uh, more precise, but we, we have to discuss if it's necessary or not. And what is not introduced, but we will introduce in the next version of the draft is that, for example, if you have fragmentation and you cannot fragment the packet because you, your value in the rule doesn't allow you to compress, to fragment that size, then you can send a pack, we can send a packet too big uh, to the sender. So next slide. And the next slide is just what we add to the uh, young data model. So we augment the rule by uh, having a proxy behavior. So the proxy behavior will tell what to do when the packet match. So by default, if there is no action, we do compression. But if there is an action, then we will do it. And for the moment, you can see in the identities that we have defined two actions, proxy none, which means that you, you do nothing, and proxy uh, ping uh, v6, and it's the behavior I, I explained. And we introduce also uh, the feed ID for ICMP uh, v6 messages. OK, Pascal? Uh, Pascal Tubercisco, yes, um, I, I, I've always seen the case where the ICMP message comes from the internet to the device. I was wondering if there are cases where you would like the ICMP message to start from the device in such a way that you ask your proxy to do something. For instance, if the device wants to send a 2K ping to see if there is 2K connectivity on the other side and doesn't want to send a message with 2K in it, just to, because of the, on the first hop, it's very costly. So it would tell the proxy, hey, uh, I want to send an SCMP to this guy, but please build whatever 2K size is below it. So you can actually check the rest of the way. That's because maybe later the device will send real 2K messages, but it's not sure at this point that they will pass. So it will just wants to assert. So I'm not sure it will, that's a good, good idea. And it's not present in the architecture. 
but for security point of view, to generate plenty of message with one message is not something. That well, not plenty. Yeah. It's just an expansion. Mm. It's just you say expand this by random to k. Um, the security mm. you have a security mm. section for it, yeah. but I'm just asking. Not yet, but for the moment we focus more on the, on the other side. On, on the other side, but we can discuss that. Yeah, Good could point. be useful. I mean, we have time for discussion. So please, please, if you have any idea or question about what we could do with uh, ICMP and SHIC, now is a very good time to, and there is no dumb question, right? Anna? Anna? Yeah. Hello. So um, I read this document and I my first input is, uh, when you use the proxy, you are, um, you are saying that the, the device is, an LP1 device. And today we have LP1 and chic device. So I think that what is due today is okay, but it's only for an LP1 device. And what is going to be for another device that has more memory or more uh, uh, parameters and, and it's not an LP1. That's my okay. start. Yeah, so in, in that case, so as I said at the beginning, we define our compress ICMP. So you can just compress it as usual and not use all the tweaks around as, uh, uh, the proxy or the compression. So um, the ICMP compression and, uh, when you have the error message. So this is totally open. If, but if you are in an LP1 device, you can, or you have an LP1 network, then you, ac you can activate the action to say, okay, now I want to save more bandwidth and all these messages will not be sent on the LP1 network. So, you, so perhaps that we need to add that uh, even if we are in uh, another network than an LP1, we can use these echo request uh, features. Because yes, as, echo request uh, we can understand can... that we can only use it for when, when there is a proxy. No, no, the echo request can be compressed as any packet and yeah. can be sent on, on the, it depends on your role. Yes, but as it is written today, we can understand that it's only used with the proxy. Okay, okay, you can clarify this. Hey, Eric Ving, uh, Cisco now right here. Just be sure that you can invent new error code, right? It's, the process will be a little bit more complex to do, uh, but feel free. I think the more information you send in ICMP message about the error is better. On the other end, it means that the normal ping from 2023, when you receive an error code, that it doesn't know it will display it a little bit worse. Mm. Okay. And the other point is that you need to be sure that all the OAM is also taking into account the extension that you are doing for Sheik, like the header, for instance. I don't know whether that's orthogonal or I there's think an it's impact. All, it's totally orthogonal. Okay, perfect. perfect. Yes, um, since it's OAM, it's not necessarily uh, trying to assert the presence, right? You might also want to assert the quality of the link. So I was wondering if we, if it's the right place here to define anything about the link quality of the, of the LP1 hubs, or if there is some coordinated work to be done with other places where OAM is being discussed, so as to, to extract you know, some quality vectors, vectors about the link quality. Like I'm on the other end of the internet and I'm using Shake with somebody. I don't know what kind of bandwidth I have with him. So is there something we could do to assert that, oh, it's very, very low, it's an LP1 or it's a six low or it's a full capability network between him and me. You know, OAM goes beyond ICMP ping, right? Yeah. So. Just an open question. I mean, maybe Eric could help, but with whom we could be working to, to see what kind of metrics we could transport about OAM in general. You, you heard the point, right, Eric? Yeah, Eric, I think, so I'm afraid I was just updating the notes, so I was not paying attention to your question, sorry. Yes, yes that, that's what I thought. Uh, so, so that's why I said I can repeat, uh, no worries. The point is, we are talking about OAM, not just mapping ICMP into mm -hmm. Shake, right? And part of the problem we have with OAM is what well, we have, we could solve with OAM, 
is assert the kind of bandwidth we have to the device because mm -hmm. we don't know really which if it's an LP1 device, a six low device, a sleeping device. And there are, there are things about this device that we might want to know so we can talk to this device in an appropriate fashion from the internet. And so I thought OAM is a very nice way to tell us about, you know, what kind of capabilities there are on the network and then on the device. And so, so for that, we need like metrics, measurements, IPPM or whatever else. And so I was wondering, because we are here to talk with other groups, which other groups we could, I mean, IPPM is clearly one, but what else? I think at least opposite with VG, right? They are defining other things, including IPFIX, for instance. Um, IPPM, uh, they mostly will come back to the interray anyway, because it's doing more stuff related to in now than to transport. Uh, but it's a good question. I don't have the answer, to be honest. So, so we would start like with some form of little requirement draft that would just be there for a while, which will need yeah, and, and you can switch. I mean, that's not because we have a, a one point OAM um, that we cannot get to ICMP1 and others, right? So I would suggest, that's a suggestion again, right? Uh, that you focus on ICMP right now so we can deliver something, but not forget the rest. Yes, and, and I, as I said, the philosophy, I forgot to name that we work with uh, Dominic Bartel on that, but it was really not to, ah, Dominic is there, so that's good, uh, not to change the actual behavior. Dominic? Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, actually, uh, since uh, Pascal said we have time for discussion, I wanted to carry on. Uh, from uh, uh, Eric's uh, previous comment. Um, and Eric said you can create new codes, uh, new types of, in ICMP. And I heard, I think Laurent said, we don't want to reveal uh, that the device is uh, an LP1 uh, device. And so when Pascal said we want to investigate what the connection is, uh, you know, when the network, uh, the bandwidth is, that's if you have a, a chic session uh, and you're part of that session, then you know it's a constrained device or a chic device. Uh, but what um, Eric said is uh, uh, if we send IPv6 messages, uh, packets to a device we, and we don't know uh, that these are constrained devices over LP1 networks, then as Laurent said, we don't want to expose that fact through ICMP messages that this is a fragile device, you can easily overwhelm it, you can easily uh, energy drain it, and you, you'd rather keep it anonymous on the internet uh, if the endpoint doesn't have a succession with it. So I think that warrants some discussion. We're kind of bouncing between two extremes here. But Since you are replying to me, Dominique, um, I, I will answer the same thing as I did for Laurent. We cannot just bar functions just because there are security, uh, possible security issues. We have to have a security sec section which addresses how we handle those concerns, right? Like you might encode it somehow, I don't know. But it's, if the feature is useful, let's discuss the feature and then let's have a security section that says, hey, here are the considerations so it does not become an attack vector. Yeah, and I'm all for the discussion. Uh, it's funny that you say if there is a security problem, you need to have a security section. I think you first have to have a security analysis and a security mechanism, then you write everything in a section. Uh, but the section does not come first, <laughs> I think. Okay. So I guess we're in sync. Yeah, so yeah, same here. So let's carry on uh, on the mailing list, I guess, uh, on this topic. OK, and with this, I guess we conclude, right? Yeah. So uh, Marco, you're, you're next.
Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, this is Marco Tiroca. This is an update on the progress and intended way forward for this document uh, intended to update the use of Shik uh, for co-op. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, this started just um, having a, a look with fresh eyes uh, early last year to um, RFC 8824 uh, that uh, when released was um, covering, for example, all the co-op options available and registered at the time. And already, of course, the, the use uh, of OSCOR for end-to-end -end protection of co-op messages. Uh, but then following that, that new reading, we noticed a number of uh, clarifications that were worth um, giving on the use of, uh, of Chic for co-op about the number of things that were uh, like tacitly assumed uh, and was worth uh, spelling out together with examples and so on, uh, especially about the, the use of Chic for co-op in the presence of, of proxies. Uh, then a number of uh, errata were also generated and discussed pretty extensively uh, also at an interim meeting. Uh, so this is the context. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, in order to address that, we proposed this document presented first time at the uh, last meeting in Yokohama. Uh, it's formally proposed update uh, to 8824 um, on a number of points, uh, clarifications around um, some, some co-op options already covered in 8824. And there was especially one erratum of this. Uh, I think it was the only one when, um, for, for which there was no um, immediate agreement that then we we able to, we were able to achieve anyway uh, during an interim meeting. Um, we are also introducing the description of how Chic uh, is supposed to be used for uh, more recent uh, co-op options, uh, clarifications on the uh, compression of the um, co-op payload marker, and and mostly about uh, how to use this uh, when proxies are uh, deployed, with or without uh, the use of OSCOR. Uh, but for sure, we by no mean intend here to change anything in the core design choice or features of Chic in general uh, or uh, for Coop in particular. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so updates from, from the previous version presented in Yokohama. First and foremost, we uh, added Anna uh, to the author list. Thank you very much for um, joining us. Uh, there's really no change uh, in the main spirit and scope uh, of the document. Um, Terminology-wise, we are well, basically addressing uh, the erratum I mentioned before that we extensively discussed at the interim meeting. Um, it was really about deciding the best way uh, to indicate uh, a TV in a rule descriptor for the combination. MO ignore CDA value sent. There was some ambiguity, and after discussing against null, empty, and so on, we ended up concluding for uh, not set. And this version one is already considering this uh, fix uh, consistently. Uh, then Anna noted that for a number of the new options we are uh, covering, um, at least in some circumstances, we can be uh, more aggressive um, in the proposed compression strategy. Uh, for example, for the op-limit option that we are introducing here, the, the original uh, behavior we had in mind for the rule descriptor was just value sent, and that value is anyway going to change as you traverse a chain, uh, a chain of hops. Uh, but of course, that option is supposed to have 16 at default value. So if, if that's the value that that option happens to uh, to have for that message, you can just take advantage of that and have a not sent um, for that option uh, altogether. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, yeah, similar thing applies to uh, other options. For the echo option, we originally talked of just value send. And uh, to give you context, uh, the echo option can be generated by a co-op server, included in a co-op response as a challenge uh, for the client that is supposed to follow up with a new request, including the same option with the uh, with the same value for a number of reasons. And Normally, that value is supposed to be generated randomly uh, by the server. That's why we originally talked of just value sent. There's not much you can do about that. But uh, there are cases documented in uh, RFC 9175 where the server can actually uh, rely on a persistent counter to generate those values. And in those cases, after a certain point, you can actually take advantage of a, a bit matching a rule, which is good. And finally, on the same line, 
something similar can be done for the request tag option. Um, it's essentially a value that uh, a client, in this case, uh, can generate and include as an option in a request in case multiple concurrent blockwise transfers are happening to prevent uh, strange attacks that can enforce a mismatch and mix up of different blocks in different uh, transactions. And, and here again, we went for value sentence general, but actually if, uh, if the client relies on a small set of well-known values for this option, one can definitely think about uh, taking uh, better advantage of a mapping send instead, so basically compressing uh, each of those well-known values into a um, uh, few bits. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, but the biggest update of this version was really about the use uh, uh, of shaking the presence of uh, proxies. Uh, the mechanics of this in itself, and again, it's just about uh, clarifications, was not uh, really extended and to give you a reminder, bottom line, uh, you don't use OScore. Uh, it's all about uh, having clear that uh, the chic rules apply hop by hop, thinking of co-op hops, of course. Uh, if you use OScore, uh, that requires uh, two different chic processing, one inner and one outer. The inner processing is end-to-end -end between the two OScore endpoints protecting uh, the co-op messages end-to-end. -end. Uh, well, the outer uh, compression is intended uh, hop by hop. Uh, we did address uh, a comment around this area uh, that Pascal gave during the presentation in Yokohama. Um, so now it's mentioned explicitly that, uh, of course, you are not required to use chic in uh, each and every single communication leg, so between each and every uh, pair of hops. Uh, for example, you, you may use it end-to-end uh, -end for the sake of the inner compression, uh, uh, hop by hop between the client and proxy, but not between uh, the proxy and the server on the other leg. Uh, Rob, you are in the queue. Perhaps this question is Bob Moskowitz. Perhaps this question is a little premature, but you mentioned the inner and outer rules. And I think about that a lot in some of the other things that I'm doing um, with uh, Sheik at, at the IP header level and so forth. Is it possible that your outer rule says that there is an inner chic rule, which is this, and you actually compress out that inner chic rule for the transmission, saving those bytes as well. And then when you process that outer rule on the other side, you then say, oh, I now have to make sure I expand that packet, put the chic rule inside so that it will work, so that you can thus, uh, it makes more complicated rules, but I'm wondering if, you know, because um, I'm always, as we all are here, we're always thinking about counting bytes on our, on our wireless links. So I wonder if, if it's possible there should be any discussion about um, acts that the outer rule compresses out the inner rule and replies it on the other side. Something maybe just to think about um, on it, but it's something which has been twisting my mind in the past couple of months. I probably felt I should air it. Uh, thanks, it is twisting. <laughs> uh, out of intuition, uh, I don't know because they cover different things. Uh, the, the, the inner rule compresses a plain text. Uh, the outer rule really compresses a co-op header. That, that's not the point they do with different things, is that the outer rule could also say that there is an inner rule here that I'm compressing out. And, and part of my rule on the other side is how to put it back in. But that is part of what the outer rule does. It also compresses out that inner rule for the trans. I don't know if it's possible or not, but I, I like you people have spent a lot more time with this than I have, and it's just just raising the point. Yeah, but it, I believe it would be good anyway that outer rules, um, when formulated, um, are formulating being aware of the inner rules preceding those. That's for sure. But thanks a lot. Uh, okay, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, still in the track of proxies and page counting. This is the, the biggest chunk of updates for this version. We added very uh, detailed and step-by-step -step examples uh, of message exchange uh, using chic with co -op in the presence of proxies uh, without OScore or uh, using OScore instead. 
uh, is the same level of detail, style, and so on considered in the examples of 8824, actually, just um, in the presence of a proxy. Uh, to be uh, as much uh, as much aligned as possible with 8824, we also consider the same uh, very basic uh, architecture considered uh, for those examples. Um, so device talking to an application server over the internet through a network gateway. And to keep things simple and uh, avoid adding yet another uh, entity in the example, uh, we collocated the co in question uh, at the network gateway. But of course, uh, th this doesn't lack of generality. And to make the examples relevant, in the presence of a proxy, we considered um, an original co-op request generated by the client as including uh, not only the URI host and URI path option, but also the proxy scheme option that uh, practically triggers uh, forwarding operations uh, at the proxy. It is also going to be uh, compressed uh, as described by the, the rule descriptors. Uh, and that is going, of course, to be uh, consumed by the co-op proxy uh, upon uh, forwarding upstream. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I, I don't think there's time to go through the examples in details, uh, also to not bore you to death, but uh, at least I wanted to collect uh, some numbers that you can extract from the uh, significant lines in the examples, just to give an idea of the uh, results uh, of the compression. And well, the example without all scores in section 6.1, with all score in section 6.2, and you can see uh, the red numbers showing the co-op message sizes before uh, compression and the green numbers uh, after compression and in, in the OSCORE case, uh, the green numbers refer to what you have really at the end. So also after the outer compression has happened, I marked the typo that I noticed, unfortunately, uh, only after submission um, already there's a figure where in the draft you should read uh, 16, but it says 15 now will be fixed in the next version. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so that was about the update. Uh, then I have um, an open point uh, and the question uh, that's mostly about um, confirming. Uh, this started and still is uh, with the trajectory in mind to update uh, ATA24. Uh, and then already in Yokohama, um, first from uh, RID, Eric, uh, we, we got a suggestion about considering this being uh, a BIS document instead. Uh, so uh, obsoleting and replacing ATA24. Um, we could see uh, good reactions uh, from different people uh, in the group. Uh, the authors believe this is a, a, a good idea to pursue. I have heard an objection. Uh, and there's a number of, of clear advantages, uh, mostly to have all the information in one single place, I believe. And it's also an opportunity to fix the rat in a clear way and to fix whatever more we find. And yeah, I started to notice something more that uh, probably is best handled with this sort of this document instead of, yeah, with other messy errata and so on. Um, so the author would like to take this direction actually, but I would like to confirm uh, today, is there any objection to transform this into a BIS document? Hearing none, not sure about the chat, of course, but. Looking in the chat. Good. <laughs> okay. Uh, next slide, please. It should be the last one. Uh, yeah, we, we're saying multiple times already today what, what this is about. Uh, then for the next version, since there's uh, clearly no objection, we uh, plan to uh, morph this document heavily to make it look like a BIS document of 8824, so merging the, the two things together. Uh, that is going to be the main thing, I believe. Uh, and then we want to um, yeah, insist a bit more on something we started to discuss among co-authors. Um, I had an exchange already a few days ago, especially with Loran, uh, in terms of extensibility. I mean, more co-op options are going to be defined in the future, and, and that's the whole point of extending uh, co-op with, with options. Uh, but still, we, we don't want to repeat this sort of exercise over and over every, every five years or so just because uh, there are more options. Uh, so this can be handled in, in two uh, parallel ways together, we think. Uh, one is the Yang data model that uh, Laurent started, uh, available um, on our personal repo and for which there is already a placeholder appendix uh, in the document. And then we would like to give, uh, 
well, a statement to start with, it will probably be, become something mandated in, in, in due time, but about um, expecting that a document uh, defining or updating a co-op option has also the duty to define or update uh, how Sheik is supposed to, uh, to handle that option. So we, we are covering some options uh, in this document for now to catch up, that is fine, but for the future, uh, yeah, the document responsible for the option should do that. Um, and this is in the same spirit of, of the OSCOR RFC uh, that, that caught up, up to the point of its publication, then defined the expectation for documents, defining new co-op options to say how they are uh, handled by uh, OSCOR, it's similar here, just uh, for Sheik instead. Pascal. Yes, uh, so um, we will be starting a, a show of hands. Uh, what we would like to do is assert whether this group is uh, happy, okay, to um, start a BIS for 8824, if that's the right. So the question will be exactly, is it okay for you to, to start a BIS document on an 824? like to see if, if that's what the group thinks is the right thing to do in this case. So I can't erase that, sorry. Oh, you just go to the tool and raise your hand. And again, we want to give equal chance to remote people. And Marco, I will count plus one for you. But, but you, <laughs> you, you can come here with your phone, you know that. Uh, yeah, I'm logged in on the laptop. I, I can do it. <laughs> no, it's okay. I, I, I can count. Plus one is within my limits. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. That saves me a lot of CPU. <laughs> okay, and I will be ending the session. So you still have four seconds. Okay, so we are getting uh, 15 participants and 15 hands raised, which tends to tell me that at least the people attending this meeting violently agree with the idea of starting a BIS document. So we'll confirm that on the mailing list as usual. And uh, if the, there is no position, the direction is, Marco, you're on your way for a BIS document here. Thank you very much, everyone. Dominic wants to say something. Yeah, I think since we have time for discussion, maybe it's time to talk again about please, the please. way. Yeah, can you hear me? No. Yes. No? What's going on? <laughs> OK, um, since you're discussing the difficulty of uh, processing with Sheik new, uh, new options that could show up, then I think uh, we had a proposal by Quentin to not interpret the options uh, with Sheik and just process the fields as they show on the wire. That would save a lot of trouble when new options are introduced, I think. So maybe we could also discuss that in the future. Yes. Okay, so do we have any more questions for the co-op BIS document? If not, we'll move to the next Thank you. item in the agenda, which happens to be the Chic Access Control. And that's Ivan speaking, or are you speaking, Laurence, Ivan? Ivan, you're here? No? <laughs> yes, I'm here. Okay, good. Just uh, maybe... Do you want to move the slides yourself or do you want us to move your slides? Uh, I think you can move me, please. Okay. What well, is yours, Ivan? You can start. So thank you very much. So this is just to update uh, from the last meeting that Laurent uh, uh, speak. Uh, so the idea of this draft is next. is to update the junk data model to add some uh, rights to uh, erase or to change uh, things on the data model so that unauthorized uh, behavior is not allowed. 
So first thing first, the idea is to uniform terms from other errors here already uh, that talks about chic. So that's why we ask many times to just be clear about that. Then we change the, the way chic, uh, the, the management architecture of chic. We add a treat model and then we are trying to see what are the all possible TV and MOE CDA combinations that can be allowed or not, and that can be vector for attacks. So next, please. So to handle all this stuff, so first we need to consider what actually is a context, what actually is a set of rules. Do we have a set of rules actually? Where is a rule database and where is a rule set? What we propose as authors is to handle everything as a context, so it can be more, it can be sim the simple way to handle it. Then, when this context is exchanged, because all, we all, we assume that uh, the context is shared between both ends, uh, then we generate what we call an instance from the draft architecture, and uh, which actually is the session. So, and the next thing is the functionality in the architecture that is actually handling the way the rules are erased or updated, which is in our view, the role manager. Maybe we will move to a context management. So we just, my question here is, we need to, to consider this actually uh, to be precise on the terms. So if you have any, uh, Please raise your hand to consider this and to uh, just to be clear about it. So I think we will we will try to discuss that uh, next. So yeah, Pascal. Yes, you asked to raise the hand, so I did. But uh, just to express a violent agreement, we need to to work very uh, precisely on our terminology. I mean, the terminology yeah. is always the beginning of times. So, yeah, we, we try in the architecture to have words. And so please comment on the mailing list if the words that we have selected in the architecture are not good, but it's not basically a responsibility of your document. It's a responsibility of the architecture. To yeah, sure, yeah, sure. Yeah, 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 that, that, that's just my question. So, because we need to move forward on the draft. So just to be clear about the terminology. So I, I know you had a, a side meeting with uh, Laurent like yesterday or something like that. And Anna, uh, thank you about that. So yeah, just to- we'll, we'll continue, we'll continue. But yeah. anyway, the architecture should be, you should have a reference, uh, um, basically um, a reference on the architecture to say that the terminology is there, unless yeah. you have a term which really is very, very specific to your document. And then if there is any issue or anything that you don't like in the uh, terminology in the architecture or anything that's missing, please go to the mailing list and say, hey, uh, this definition is not good or we're missing this term. And then yeah, we work sure. on it on the mailing list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So please, next. So here is the idea we have about the management architecture. So the idea is that we have a request, a management request that will be, be uh, you will be done using netconf, resconf, or coreconf that come from uh, that arrives at the other end. Then we have uh, the access control, and then on the other side we have the rule manager who will be in charge of uh, detecting uh, bad behavior. So the idea here is that the rule manager uh, before uh, will uh, create, read, update, or delete. Uh, a change that will be done in the context or in the role. So next, please. So we also add in the draft a threat model. So the idea is that there is a rule manager in charge of applying changes to the rule database. So here is where we don't know how to talk, how to uh, call it, maybe it's just the context. When a, manage, when a management requires arrives at the chicken point. A chicken point is just the core of the device. So then the idea of this threat model is that changes can only be effectively applied when the rules, when we are sure that both endpoints share the same information. And then the selection of a rule to be applied uh, on an endpoint when a packet arrives uh, will be the one that offers the best performance. So then the, 
we define some attack scenarios that can be considered. And these are limited to the rule manager layer. And then the idea is that in our trend model, we only consider that a single endpoint in a, single, in, a, in a given moment has been compromised, either the core or the device. And then the uh, compromised point can be or not able to effectively deliver management requests. So if he effectively delivers a management request, the context will be changed. And there can be some consequences from the security point of view. Next, please. So to think about that, we think about uh, all the possible target value matching operator on a CDA combinations of uh, that can be happen in a chic normal uh, exchange. So we have different uh, all the CDAs that have been defined. Maybe we can add some. I saw that, for example, in the uh, previous presentation of Laurent or, or next for our type of uh, protocols, we will include some different uh, matching uh, CDA, so we can add it. And the idea is to see what combination can be done and what combination will not be allowed. So for example, if you just have equal and not sent, that will be okay. And it will be the normal behavior of uh, chic exchange. And we do the same for all the possible combination. We also add a term that we have discussed in the last meeting, which is not set. So the idea of not set is that, for example, in a, if it doesn't exist, so it's something we called written uh, not set, which means that it does not exist on the data model that is used in that moment. So, and, the, and we also identify those that can be a, 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 an attack vector. And the idea is to not allow those combinations that can be an attack vector. So in that case, it will be, for example, a management procedure that will change the length of the residue. In that case, we will lose some information. So in that case, when the rule, when the rule changes, the information that will be exchanged, we will miss some information. So that's uh, the point of having this uh, table here. So next, please. So the first scenario is a compromised device. So it's a compromised device that in its rule manager under the control of an attacker can send or modify some chic rules to the core. So the idea is that there is a, a message that will try to change the context on the core site. Then, uh, the impact here will be, um, so for example, here we put an example, the machine on, uh, operator and CDA ignore and not sent for rules which are not compressed and rules uh, such as not compressed or not fermentation. In this case, for this kind of attack, there is no risk of information lost, but there is a risk of DOS type attack that because we can have many packets that can pass at the core level. Next uh, slide, please. And the second mm, kind of attack we uh, imagine is that uh, there is, uh, the idea is the same. The device will try to change some rules at the core site, but uh, in this case, the length of the residue changes. So it means that we, before we had a, a, a residue that is bigger than the newer, and then we can lose some information. So in that case, we will see on the table before, those cases where there is an X, so in that case, we can reduce actually the uh, length of the, of the residue. Next, please. And then we have a more problematic uh, kind of attack is the case where the core is compromised. So the idea is the same, the core will try, the compromised core will try to inject some uh, management messages to the device and try to change the context on the device. Uh, the, the idea is the same. So with those combination of uh, MOCDA that reduce the size of the residue, which in turn may some more attractive since it decreases, since it increase the rate of compression. Next, please. I think it's all. Yeah. 
that's the last slide, yes. So we are open for question of suggestion or more type of attacks that can be uh, uh, considered. Yeah. Yes, let's go. Okay, so since I'm the first raising hands, um, I was comparing your work with the the way we we wrote our charter and the milestones that we have for this working group. And when I look at the draft, what I see is a number of components which end up kind of spread spread across the deliverables that we have for this working group. Uh, one of our deliverables is the architecture and some of what you just presented, like those attack scenarios, etc. I just wonder if at a high level they are not part of the security section of the architecture. Because you're talking about the possible attacks against the objects that the architecture is manipulating. So we should be saying, hey, because we have those objects, uh, there are those possible threats. And because we have those flows, then they could be attacked here, here, here. It looks really like a, a security analysis uh, at the high level on what we are doing at Chic. And so, so for that piece, I wonder if it should not be part of the architecture in the security section. And then, okay, if you want to, to react to that, and then I'll continue. No, yeah, it's just to say that the first idea of this draft was to uh, extend the uh, data model to add the security control, and then we start to think about what will be the scenarios. But yes, that, that is an open question. And, and if it fits better in the draft architecture, yeah. You know, I'm not it's... saying you're wrong to write it. You're completely right to, to write it. I'm just saying that there is a logical place in the different documents that we have for the different pieces that you, you're writing. Now, the, the second uh, thing is we have actually two milestones. One of them is how do you install the, route, the, the rules uh, in the devices, like the low-power devices? Uh, how do you install them? How do you update them? So that's the, the, the provisioning and the filter, the firmware update over the air or whatever. Um, how do you install those rules in such a manner, ma manner that you can trust what's being installed? And then that's step one, if you like, like the time equals zero, provisioning time. And then there is another milestone, which is <clears throat> more about I'm setting up this session between A and B. <clears throat> How do we agree that we are using the right rules and the right parameters for those rules? So you see, we, we have two different places where we will be possibly modifying the set of rules or some parameters like the IP address inside the rule, which really can change the rule dramatically. So both places as spelled in our milestones would require the type of activity that you're talking about. And I'm, I'm just wondering if, yeah, if that is a separate document, which is really possible. And then if those two documents that we are chartered for <clears throat> would refer to your work, is that the right way of doing it? Or if there is a, a, another way for doing it? That's basically what I'm wondering right now. Yes, I think you're, you're right. We, this has been introduced in this document because it was not present uh, anywhere else. And since we are introducing management, it means that we can modify things now on rules. So we have to be very careful on the way we, we are doing it. So we need to understand very well uh, what are the nature of the rule to make, for example, if you change a value, the impact is very low because you don't attack a, number, a large number of packets because you just send one parameter. But if you use uh, an ignore, for example, then you have a larger, uh, you can attack more packets. So the cost of the attack will be different regarding the kind of uh, rule we are using. Sure. But I mean, I understand and completely agree. And, but my question was more in practice, right? We are chartered for two documents. None of them is really that, but both documents need this data model that you want to present. So do we want to, to make a document which is just the data model? So it's very clear which information is available. And then we explain the two other documents how this data model is being used. Or do we write the data model in the first of those two documents, like the provisioning, and your document will be extended for explaining the whole provisioning game? 
How do you see it? We have already the data model because it's uh, it's an RFC now. But what we put in this RFC is that there is some uh, uh, we cannot use the standard young access control because we are not protecting a leaf, but we are more protecting a rule. And this uh, rule has several leaf, and depending on the value, you want to protect it or not. So, yeah, okay. So here we we have to to understand very well what we are doing to say, okay, you can push this, there is no danger or a little danger, or you don't push that because this, uh, this is a very high danger. Still, do you want a separate document for the data model that expresses this, or should it fall back into the provisioning document? I think it can go to other documents. It's just because we didn't have it right now, so we start the, the study here. OK, so if somebody so, starts the document about provisioning, then we'll end up merging at the time of adoption or something. Yeah. Or architecture. Yes, there is the piece. OK, and Quentin, you're next in line. There is Quentin, yes. Slide where there is this matrix of uh, the attack vectors. Quentin? Yes. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Is it? Oh, okay. Uh, could you go back to the slide uh, where you have all of the attack vectors? This kind of like matrix of what's absurd and yes, this one. Um, to comment, um, have you considered the case where uh, someone would want to exploit a compute star on a field that doesn't make sense? For example, you have a ignore. Uh, for some value, uh, no, sorry, a set for some value, and then, um, so so the idea is that uh, you you use the compute star for some of the value where there's there's no reason for a compute something. So say that you want to update some rule where you have a set uh, something and then uh, send something else, and you replace it by a compute star, because because. Uh, Actually, my, my question is that you can change a set not sent to a set compute self, right? Uh, ignore not sent to ignore compute something else. And the question is, is it possible to make uh, the, the decompressor fail just by uh, setting the value to some function that does not exist, basically? So yeah, that's a good question. But the thing is, we also have discussed this with Laurent. The, the idea is that if there is something that is not set as ET, uh, it doesn't exist in the model. So it will not match anything. So there will be no place to attack in that case. Hmm. Okay. Um, and, and the second question is, um, it seems that those are protecting, I mean, the idea is to protect the field descriptors of rules. And have you considered the case where you would add a field descriptor to a rule? Because have by just field. adding, you, you have a rule that exists in your rule set, and you'd, yeah. you had an extra field descriptor to the, to the rule. And by default, uh, by doing that, we just invalidate the rule because there is an extra field ID, which is not going to be matched uh, by the, uh, so the description of the is a, so a descriptor of a rule, that's a rule ID, yes? Um, no, sorry. So you have a rule uh, that lists uh, five fields, and then you want to add an extra field for this rule. So add an extra field. Yeah, yeah, that is not included. No, that will be not allowed because it's not in the. Yeah. Anna? Yeah. You want to add a fill ID in a rule to create a new rule. So you create a new rule. Okay. So you're not replacing uh, the rule with the same rule ID. Is that, that's, that's what you say. Yeah. Okay. So, so 
uh, actually the, 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 the question is, uh, since we're considering uh, access control, the question is uh, when we are modifying a rule, so a, a rule with a given rule ID, um, the, the modification could either be on the field descriptors, so each of those uh, uh, IPv6 version and etc. And we, so the question is how we protect uh, the structure of a rule basically uh, in the in what you're proposing. Because I could just push a new version of the rule by just adding a, an extra field ID. And this would so be I mean, we are not discussing yeah. all the put simple attack vectors. I mean, this is about to protect generally about attacking, but we agree that there are tons of ways if people can write into it. I mean, there are thousands of ways in which we can attack, right? That's why we want to protect. Okay. So we can spend I, I, that, the meeting that's discussion. That's another uh, allows you to write or not write something in the room. Okay, so, so you say that there is a way in the data model to say uh, you cannot update a rule by adding extra extra field descriptors, basically. But okay, I understand the, the, the comment by, yeah. by Pascal. In the, in the data model we have created, you can add new fields, but you, on a, you can also block the addition of new fields. Maybe we, we have to go in more details and discuss where it could be interesting. For example, for co-op, it could be interesting to add a new uh, URI path or delay an URI path regarding the structure of the exchange. So maybe we can say we focus only on this, we can add only this nature of, uh, of fields and uh, not for IPv6, where you, it's totally stupid to duplicate an IPv6 version, for example. Yeah, okay. Okay, so do we have other questions about, so the global idea, I mean, do people think that this is something useful? Let me just, I'm not saying that we will adopt this document right now because the whole structure of how this work fits within our charter is still unclear to me. But um, just, I would like to get a, a raise of hands about whether this is useful and globally necessary for, for LP1. So just, ask useful question mark. And I'm not saying we adopt, I'm saying, do we need this thing, right? Okay, so um, yes, I have one single not raised. Uh, obviously, you don't have to, to tell me who you are or what, but if you have something to say about why uh, this might not be a good idea to work on, either now on the mailing list, that would be really welcome. Because a consensus is not, this, it's not a majority call, right? It's, if I have a good objection, then we consider it. So we have a vast majority of, yes, it's, a, it's interesting work. Uh, there is one hand which is not raised, which I take as it's not useful. And if that's really what you have in mind, uh, please share if you can. And with this, we'll move to the architecture, I guess. <clears throat> so, I will stop the... So as I was saying, as we move from uh, an LP1-only architecture to a chic architecture, we open uh, chic over the internet, which means that the prime has grown bigger and we have more things to look at in the architecture. Next slide, please. 
So there are two main uh, subjects for the discussion today. I made them to two agenda items, but uh, it's going to be a single slide away. So the first thing is, uh, as we worked on Chic and generalized it from, say, LoRa or Sigfox onto over the internet, we realized that implicit behind the scene of the exchange that we were compressing, there was a concept of a session. And that session has endpoints, as usual, but it has also points on the active set of rules that are being used. And uh, I'll, I'll say more about what I mean by active set of rules or rule set. And uh, there is also uh, an agreement that has to be taken between the two endpoints of who is the device and who is the application. And then there is how we set up that session. Like, how do we agree on which set of rules we're going to work, but not only. Uh, how do we agree on which parameters, uh, I'll say more about that, apply to these set of rules and possibly uh, what additions from a original set of rules are being made and controlled by the work that Laurent has just been presenting. But at some point, once we, we have both parties, which kind of seem to have an agreement on what they are working on, maybe there is, there is uh, some synchronization work to make sure that effectively they have the same data or, or they exchange the less data that they don't have till we are sure that they will operate on the exact same set of rules. Because if they don't, then we can get any result. Next slide, please. So, so we kind of agree that there is this concept of a session. There could be more than one session uh, between two parties. So there will need to be a session of ID, something like a UDP port. And when I say something like a UDP port, I really think it. You'll see, you'll see it in the next slide. But basically, th there is the, 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 the need of something possibly abstract, but that really looks like an IPv6 header, an, a new extension header, if you like. And this new extension header would have to signal a checksum, like UDP, would have to signal a session ID, like a UDP port. And it may transport some metadata because sometimes you have to say something about the compression that's going on. I'm not saying that we'll, this will be in line in every chic packet. That's not the intention, not all of this. The intention is that it's compressed to what is effectively used. For instance, in LoRa, it's compressed to zero because we know implicitly which session. We don't use a checksum because we use the CRC, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this can be compressed to zero. But it can also uh, be extended with options to contain everything that the session needs to know uh, about this particular packet or the, con the context of that packet. So abstractly speaking, we are after defining a header. Like I said, I'm not saying it's going to be in line in the packet, but we'll see that the process of compressing, there is a logical step where this abstract header is useful. Next slide, please. So. If you think you're going down the, the steps of your stack, at some point you're, you're building this IPv6 plus upper layer protocol, and there can be a header there, right? Um, and then the upper layer uh, uh, data unit, um, protocol data unit, then, then at some point you want to compress it. So you go down the stack and say that you want to compress it in this example uh, just before the, the ULP or something. So the logical, and then again, uh, it's kind of virtual, but the logical step in your stack is to kind of insert a chic header using the proper chic, uh, the proper IPv6 way, meaning the IPv6 header would say next header is chic. And then there would be this chic header just like a UDP header or something. And then the, the next header there would say ULP and then you have ULP. And once you do that, when you do that, you start compressing. But there is one logical step before compression when you kind of reinsert that header, insert that header, so you know how to do the compression and to whom it's going. So all the session information, et cetera, goes there. Next slide, please. And once you've done that, there are a number of options of what could happen. And that's a discussion. I'm not like pushing anything on you. I will show you three possibilities and kind of uh, what I would like to do is gather feedback from the group about, you know, where we want to go. Do we want one of those possibilities only? Do we want to be able to support them all? 
which probably means that we need three IP protocols um, uh, and three ether types. So, so that, that's, that's kind of the discussion I want to have. So the first kind of logical step from the previous state where we are, where we have inserted this Shikeda, is to decide, to, to basically to compress the ULP and beyond. And this we have to do either way. We, we, that's what, why we're here, we want to compress that claim. And the result would be now logically, you've got your IPv6 header, which says next header chic. Then you've got your chic header, which still says next header ULP, but, but uh, it goes on the wire like this. It really means that what's coming after is compressed by check. So you know which session you're in because of the red piece. You know the checksum of the whole thing because of the red piece, which kind of means that if the upper layer has a checksum, now it can be compressed. Just like when you turn on UDP over UDP, right? You can compress one of those two. You don't have to, to send them all. Well, same thing. We, we could kind of say, hey, part of the, we are saving two bytes from in the green piece because now we have the, the checksum in the red piece. So it's not like we pay the full price of the chic header, we're just moving things around. And then we're protecting not only the green piece, but we're also protecting the red piece with, with, with the checksum. So we could just do that and stay there. And the cost would be, well, we've got eight bytes. You know, that's the usual price for an extension header. There's no choice in there. Uh, we would have eight bytes plus options in the chic header. And then we would have the, 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 basically the residue and the, the uncompressed piece which would be in the green uh, side. So we could decide, hey, that's what we do, that's what we, we live with, and then we have to agree with the internet that a uh, chic header can, can, be trans can be going through. That's gonna work in a closed domain, and as you know, there will be all those firewalls which could, be, uh, which could give us some problems. Next slide, please. So this is the alternative where we decide that when we say that the next header is chic, then everything after it is compressed, including the chic header. So we take the whole thing as a big bulk and we run chic over it, meaning that the first green bit here is already a rule, which is the beginning of all the rules which will be used to, to compress this particular packet. Well, all the, all the terms in that rule, which will, you know, it's a rule ID, it starts with a rule ID. So what that means is that the endpoint that receive that must be able to decode. And that's part of the question that Bob has been asking this morning on the mailing list. Yes, you did. Um, so the, 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 the endpoint which receives that must know the rule that will be used to decode the red piece before it even knows what session that is because the red piece encodes the session. And supposedly the, the session identifies the set of rules. So there must be some rules which can be used by default because it's not signaled anywhere which rule set you're talking about. And that will be one of the discussion we will have later. Is there some global rules that will apply that must be used for chic headers? So you know how to decode the red piece and from the red piece, now you know your session and blah, or how do we do that, right? Certainly it's not the global design of chic to have hard-coded rules in everybody in every devices. We want it to be free to, for each session to have our own rules. But basically, if we compress from the first bit of the chic header, at least the two parties, the two endpoints, need to have the same set of rules to decode the red thing. Otherwise, they won't even know which session they're talking about. Next slide, please. So third alternate. Third alternate is, is, is we kind of do it in two steps. So you come back to the first alternate where we did not compress the chic header, but then you compress the, the first the PDU as you did. So you were in that step. I have compressed my PDU, but I have not from the, from the ULP, but I've not yet compressed my chic header. And then I compress the chic header separately. So the endpoint is still a, a green bulk after the IP header, but probably the set of rules that uncompresses the first green bulk, the, 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 the chic header itself, can be this quote-unquote well-known set of rules and is completely independent of the uh, PDU2, starting from the real ULP, meaning that you run two passes, one pass just to get your chic header, 
And once you have your Sheik header, that means you have your sessions, you've got all your metadata. With this, you have everything in your hands to decode what's coming later. Second pass, now you have your session. I know my roles. I apply the rules. So it's, it's a more logical way of seeing things uh, than saying, um, you know, just the option before, I'm compressing everything in one step. Just do it in two logical steps. So now the, the question that we're in front of you is, are all those things useful or is there just one of them that's useful or two of them? Now just one last and then we'll have the discussion about usefulness. I just picked that one, but it, would, it could work with all three. It is now, okay, I'm not in my limited domain. I know I can have to go through firewalls. So I have to, to do UDP over that, right? So you end up still in your stack uh, after the, uh, well, before the, the chic header, after the IPv6 header, you end up inserting a UDP header, meaning that your packet now looks like IPv6 net header, U, next header UDP, uh, UDP two ports, source port, destination port, say the packet's going uh, to, to the application side, the destination port would be chic, that replaces the next header that we had before, and the source port would be the session two byte session. And as we work that out, you realize that in the chic PDU1, which is the compression of the chic header, the session is now no more useful because it is the source port of UDP, so it can be compressed. The checksum is now in UDP, it can be compressed. And as, as before, the checksum in the ULP can also be compressed. Right, we, we, I did really. we don't have to have them in line. They can be recomputed because the receiver checking the UDP header, the, the light blue one, will know that the whole thing is good, so it's okay to recompute all the checksum as you expand everything. Okay, so that's the UDP that provides the session ID in the source port, the uh, next header because the destination port is check, and the uh, uh, the checksum, because that checksum proves the, the rest of the packet. So th that's, I, I used, you know, the, the two green blocks, but you could imagine that all three formats that we've seen before could apply from there. And now, now that we've seen like, a, you know, the, the, the possibilities that we have in front of us, uh, the discussion really is, is uh, what do we want to see in our packets? What do, do we want to see in the air? and open mic. I don't know if you've got overcomplicated here or not, um, because it's like whatever your sheet rules, I mean, you're enumerating a whole bunch of cases here and it will be the specific case people thinking about figuring out what they need to do. Uh, so like when I'm looking at the case of command and control for UA, which is running over UDP, which, is, which includes DTLS, which then has the actual command and control protocol, my rule is gonna com totally compress out UDP. It is compressed to zero. Um, the DTLS using the compressed form DTLS, it just is. But guess what? DTLS has a sequence number and the command and control also has a sequence number. So, I'm, so even though that, that payload's inside the DTLS um, um, payload, squeeze out that sequence number because you know exactly where it is and, and, then, and then put that back in. And so um, it's like, you're, you're, maybe what you're doing here is guidelines for people who are thinking about their particular application and how they do it. Because I also have the case where um, I'm running over broadcast media. So there is no um, um, community here. It's not a point to point. It is, it is one to many. It may be IP to IP multicast, no, any cast rather. Um, and so, so the destination address there is any cast. And so that she header, um, everybody who receives, receives that any cast going to know, have to know what to do with it. Um, or, or when we go to the ethernet type, it's, it's um, ethernet broadcast. So it's um, maybe what you're doing here is good guidance 
for people like me who are thinking about what they want to do? Um, or uh, I don't know. I, uh, so Bob, you, if there's more here, this is, you know, I'll, I'll stop here. Bob, Bob um, all you've been describing, but the Monte Cast thing, which is great, very interesting, is how you play this game. I'm not talking at all on how you play this game, right? Your sequence counter and things, everything happened, how you build this green block. That's not our discussion. Yeah. Our discussion is how you encapsulate it in network ABC, could be the OCB, mm -hmm. could be anything else. But the compression you've been talking about is how you do that, and you do it your way. And we don't even right. provide you guidance here. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we, we yeah, could need that you, guidance, but we don't even do it. Maybe you're trying to do here is to get people to think they can do that. They can do that so that somebody who's looking at this the first time say, oh, I can actually do what I want to do. Uh, so, or otherwise, this is overly complicated. Unless your, your goal here is to guide people down a path that there are lots of things you can do with this. Well, overcomplicated. It's more like a general canvas that yeah. tells you what could virtually be there. Mm -hmm. And so, so what's important is when you compress this red thing, which is virtually there in every chic packet in the world. Mm. What do you really have in your packets? Right. Could be zero, mm -hmm. right? Because if, if, we, if we do like what is represented here, what we've done is we've compressed that to what's useful to you. Yeah. And, and this, like, like you saw, this UDP is just when you want to go through firewalls, which yeah. is not your case. So in your case, you don't you do that. You do one of the three other formats. Mm. I, basically, I'm agreeing with you, Pascal, but I'm wondering if we need this amount of choices and options in the, the document. In the architecture, in we the architecture. need it because we'll be applicable to anybody. So, yeah, so in, in the your... architecture, you say, we're, we're guiding you to how to think about Sheik to apply to new rule. And maybe there's wording around this which is needed it so that all, the all these choices are framed to get the, the, the reader to frame their thoughts. I love it. I love it. So we'll try, I try to write along those lines. But the bottom line for you is you will end up eliding this because you don't want over UDP. You will use one of the three choices. And then if, you if there is nothing in the session because everything is implicit for you, this one will fully also go down to zero. So when you look at your bits, it will be exactly what you described, but it falls into the general architecture. And so you can say, hey, I'm compliant, right? Just by sending zero bits, you're compliant, which is kind of good. Laurent? Yes, just to, we, we try it on uh, IPsec during the hackathon, and it's something that looks uh, very exciting and uh, works well. So what uh, I like is that if you, you can stay in the regular case we are right now, so if you don't define a chic header, you will not have a chic header. If you define a chic header, then you can do what you want, either make it totally compressed and it disappear from, uh, because all the things are all the important information like the UDP uh, next up uh, uh, information is stored in the context. So you, we don't send any bytes. Uh, and so there is a lot of flexibility, and so we and we just send what we need. Of exactly. course, we have to define context on, on both ways to say which information is important in, in that scenario. Completely agree. That's exactly what this slide, slide tries to illustrate, is if you decide to encapsulate it inside UDP, then remember what is in the default header. There is a checksum. Well, it's elided because it's in UDP. There is a, a destination uh, or a next, uh, a next header. Like you said, it could be there or it could be elided if there is only one protocol that your rules are, are compressing. And uh, there is a session ID, which is also there. Meaning that either, when you do over UDP, the only thing that you find there by default is the next header, if you have more than one next header. Otherwise, there is not even that. This is compressed to zero over UDP. So quickly, because time is running, Eric Vink is an individual contributor here. So thank you, Pascal. The session is a NOPAC number, right? I'm sorry? The, the session ID is a, a NOPAC number, because if you use it in a it's, UDP... It's like a source port. It's, 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 but it's, it's, a, it's a NOPAC, so it can be any value. It can be any value, yeah, okay. uh, unless not the, below... The, the other point, yeah. it's end-to-end. -end. So the first packet here is never seen on the wide, right? The first packet on the top. It will never be on the wide. The only one you see 
it's end to end, the compression, right? So you will only see over the network, the bottom one. What do you mean over the network? This, the packet is transmitted starting here, right? Everything goes okay. on the wire. But the, the one, the first of the top is a theoretical one that will never appear on the network. Oh, the, 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 this piece, yes. Yeah, yeah, the top well, one. that's a question to the group, I mean, but yes, I mean, what's the point? No, no, because that's very important. You cannot change and compress packets on the fly. Oh, the oh it, it's in the stack. I mean, what? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So one point. And the other point, for sake of time, we can talk later. Extension header. Normally, we don't define any new extension headers. It can be only hop by hop or destination, and I think in this case, well, which is okay. That's eight bytes anyway that you have to burn. It's, it's yeah. not at VIP level. We, with. No, no, but we, it's, it's correct. Yeah. Well, whatever. Uh, we don't. I misunderstood, but. Normally, you don't. And uh, I can, kind of, we would be asking for an exception to the rule because this exception header would never fly in the air. It's just, it's just to have a, 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 an abstraction that we can play with inside the stack. But the goal is to never fly it in the air. So maybe, I mean, uh, yeah, I understand it's an exception to the rule. Now, you, you want to call it destination option? We could call it a destination option. So we could have a destination option header and put that inside an option in the destination option header, if that's what you're after. I'd rather not do that, but if, if we don't get this next header uh, assigned because of what you just said, that's plan B. Pascal, we have one question and then we have to finish okay. this part. Hi, Pascal. I don't know much, but I wanted to get two clarifications. One related to extension headers. If we have shic extension header with some other extension header, what will be the behavior? Uh, the second ext shic extension header should always be the first one? Well, no, no, it, it, should, it doesn't need to be, right? You just place it where you want in the chain and everything after mm -hmm. him is comprised and everything before him is not comprised. That's why I wanted to make it uh, an extension header because you're, can, you're really free to place it where you want. Now, as Eric pointed out, uh, we know that supposedly we are, not, we, we are not allocating new extension headers. And so the plan B for this would be a destination option. The cool thing about destination option headers is that you can have two of them. So, so you could have one, just like, you know, when you have a routing header, you can have a destination option header before the routing header and one after the routing header. Meaning that the routing, when some of them applies to the next hop, some of them applies to destination. Since the so so goal, we could do the same trick. Since the goal is compression here, don't you think architecture will be simpler if shake destination header is the last extension header, then you don't have to do anything beyond that? Wouldn't it simplify the architecture? Um, so I'm thinking about if you have extension headers before shake, then they are you not can compressed. do hop by hop processing. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean everything that is before shake is not compressed. So I would, you, you cannot compress a hop by hop header, can you? Not with shake, you, you must have a, because, because the, the, the hops in it's the middle expensive. are not part, well, they're not part of the session. So they don't understand the way you compress it. It has to be an end, an end thing. So, so if, if you have a hop by hop, certainly we would need to signal that it is before the shake header, obviously, because you know, the shake session is between the endpoints. So that's why when, when Eric said you cannot have a, a new next header of yours, then I said, yes, then it's a destination option. That's why, because it cannot be processed. It has to be after the, the hop by hop. And um, second question I had about default rules. You were saying that we should have some default rules to start with. I didn't understand those rules will be part of the architecture, that architecture dictates this is a default behavior or is it going to be something configuration specific for a given network. Okay, these are the rules I'm starting with. And um, so I didn't understand. You're, you're completely right. I mean, that's, that's one of the things Which I one? wanted to discuss today. Uh, we have no answer. We, we have no certitude there. That's, that's those things that we're asking today uh, to this meeting. Because I just wanted to point out that the two endpoints must know how to decompress that if, if we fly this compressed. At least the two endpoints meaning that there must be a shared agreement, at least with, between the two endpoints, how to compress that, decompress that, before you know which session you're talking about. So this is certainly cross-session between those two endpoints. Now, is, and, and Bob said, hey, I'm doing multicast, so I'm sending that to all the UAVs. 
or any cast. I'm sending that to one of them. Meaning now this, this prior agreement on how to decode this has to be shared before the first packet between all those UAVs, right? So, so how you share that, is it global or not global? This is not, uh, we are late already? We are very late, yes. We have 10 minutes left. No, 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 Laurent, we have, we have till noon, right? No, no, 11.30? Yeah, oh, okay, okay, <laughs> move on. But, but yes, the, the, I, we have this question on what is the scope of knowledge for this set of rules for, to compress the right thing? Okay, next slide, please. And I'll go fast because, yes, I realize. <laughs> um, so, so, no, no, just show me that one, it's important, and then maybe we'll skip the rest. Um, there is this discussion on mailing list on what is a chic context. We have to define it. There was an initial discussion in uh, 8724 uh, about what is a chic context, and that we really said it's the rule set. But as we move on, we realize that the set of rules uh, is not enough to describe the context. So everything you need to know about the session is not just the initial set of rules. First, there is a baseline set of rules that, for instance, the device provider will program into his device or will give us a signed version on the web. But then there can be amendments like uh, all those things that Laurent said, we can sign and say this guy can do it, etc. What kind of deltas we want to apply on the original set of rules, the amendments. And this could be done through management. And then there is what we call the rule data. For instance, this rule could be made for your IP address, but when we build a device, we don't know what the IP address will be for that device. So that, that should be something like $1. And, and then when we instantiate the rule, meaning I take the rule set, I take all the amendments, I boil that down to a set of rules, I still have a number of variables that I need to set, like what's my IP address. Maybe it's a bad example, but you have to say it. Well, we, it's also another set of management da manageable data, which is the rule data. All this is part of the context and all this has to be completely synchronized between the endpoints. If they don't agree on all this data, then we won't be able to compress and decompress correctly. It has to be synchronized and validated. And then there are all the real-time data. And for us, the context is all this. Next slide. Very quickly. Okay. And well, we'll move on with that because we don't have time. But we also need to, to structure the, the, the data and specify the way we will be exchanging rules. But now we've got the discussion on ESPs. Uh, so let's, let's move on with the security piece. So you see there are things to discuss. The summary in, on the mailing list is we had three models which compress the, uh, the chic packet. And then we can place one of those three over UDP. Do we want to see those three models in the air? Are there use cases for the three of them? Can we say, let's pick one of them? If we pick one of them, then a single IP protocol is enough. If we need more than one, then we need as many IP protocols and these are types as we use of those three models. And then once we pick some models, we go. <laughs> okay, maybe we can put that on the mailing list and yeah. give the floor right. to, to Daniel. We, to, we have only five minutes left. Sorry, Daniel. Hi, everyone. So um, I will try to be brief because um, I'd like also um, to get some feedback from you and uh, um, some, some discussion if, if it's possible. So um, if you have any, any specific question, just jump into um, the mic. Next slide. So this, this work is happening in, um, in IPsec ME for now. Um, we are charter, but the work has not been adopted. It should happen soon. Um, so I will keep that um, the Chic Working Group up, up to date. Um, if you, um, I mean, uh, to my understanding, that's going to be adopted in IPsec ME. But uh, if you want to discuss that, um, I mean, uh, I'm encouraging the Chic Chair to discuss with the IPsec ME Chair, which is Tiro. And he's in San Francisco, so please, um, um, next slide, please feel free to contact him. So basically, what is an IPsec packet? It's a, it's a clear text packet, IP packet that you have encrypted. Um, of course, IPsec, you have different modes and so on, but um, um, that's the thing. So there are two things we need to compress. 
the clear text packet before it's being encrypted. And then when it's encrypted, uh, you can compress the header. So there is a two-step thing. Um, one difficulty I had, one question I, I basically had, is that when you compress the clear text, you may end up with um, um, a, a, a number of bits that do not really match an entire number of bytes. And so um, to do that, I mean, to, in, when you're compressing, you have to compress a, um, an integer number of bytes. So um, I added a structure, which is a sort of padding. Um, but uh, this is one of the questions I'm, um, I'm wondering if it's the right way to do. And, um, oh, maybe we can go to the next slide. And um, another thing I, 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 I was doing is that uh, we, we are compressing as much as we can. Um, so we are taking, whenever we can, we're taking the, the parameters from uh, lower layers. And um, we we still need to make sure that these lower layers at the very end, we, we have that number. So that's why we, we're very much interested in having a proof of concept um, and uh, we, uh, with OpenShift, for example. So here is um, an ESP packet. Um, so here you have the payload data and you have some padding and this is the encrypted part of it. Next slide. Okay, so yeah, uh, regarding the, the chic context that we need to, to have to, um, to perform the compression, a lot of these parameters have been agreed because when you are encrypting a packet, you, you, you do have a uh, negotiation protocols where you at least agree on, on the key you're going to use to encrypt that packet. And so because you have that negotiation protocol, we can almost agree on every parameters that we need to perform the compression and the decompression. And that's um, one way to, uh, I would say, to synchronize the, the context between two peers. So here is the, the chic context we're basically using, but actually most of these parameters are already agreed by IIG v2 which is the negotiation protocol for IPsec. And I mean, the additional parameters that we need to, be, to, to agree on is very limited. It's on the next slide, but I think it's four or five parameters. Um, one of the things that we, um, we also introduce is that the way we are compressing ESP is just one way. And we would like to give the, maybe the possibility for um, other people to implement another profile. So um, we, we're just defining one profile for now. Um, next slide. Next slide. And so um, to, um, to agree that we, we, we have to do an, an Ike extension. So at the end, our profile uh, ended up in almost reducing by uh, every ESP packet uh, if you're talking about a VPN, IPv6 and IPv6, uh, by 32 bytes, which make it um, quite um, useful. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I let Lauren say what he wants to say. Please go ahead. Yes, so you mean that you use Ike to provide the rules to the other hand? Um, actually, I mean, the rules are being defined in the profile. And we agree on using the profile with some parameters that uh, could be used to generate all the rules. For example, if you say um, we are using the MSB to uh, compress the SPI, for example, you need to understand how many bytes you are compressing. And that number of bytes is being agreed with IGV2. OK, thank you. Daniel, you can continue. Yeah, I can, I can hear you. Go ahead. OK, so uh, with just one thing. we So this draft has been standing for a long time. Um, we already had um, uh, similar things to, to compress ESP. Um, 
uh, that was mostly uh, motivated by IoT use cases. And um, we basically manually define and how we want to do to compress each field. So, um, I mean, we're very happy that uh, Chic has been published and that we can re reuse, um, uh, I mean, a generic framework. And that's that's why this work has been revived. Um, we are, um, I mean, we, we hope to make a huge progress by the end, uh, by the next ITF meeting um, on that. So what do you expect from this group? I mean, do you want some reviews on that? So I, I understand that the intention is not to publish uh, here, right? So it's more like reviews. Do you want reviews copied uh, IPsec me? I mean... Yeah, we, I mean, um, at least me, I'm, I, I will try. I, I, will, I will make that synchronization between the two working groups. Uh, most of the work, I would say for now, uh, is how we can handle uh, the chic beast. And uh, how we so that's most of the work I think is going to happen in chic at, at least for now. Um, so so that we clearly define how we compress, decompress. We make sure we are aligned with, um, with the chic protocol, the chic architecture, um, and then um, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, that's where I see the work for now. Okay, so most most of the work happens here for now, but then you come back to IPsecMe when when you're happy with the chic piece, right? Or you can parallelize some of it. Yeah, I will parallelize. I mean, uh, there is no. I will in any case. I will copy the two two groups. Um, um, yeah, that's. Um... Okay, so thank. Thank you. And uh, unless there is a question, I guess it's time for us to conclude this meeting. So thank you all for uh, being with us for those two hours. And uh, you realize that we have a, a good number of uh, interesting architecture questions on our plane, uh, plate. And uh, so, so, yes, a lot of good work in front of us. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And thank you all. Thank you. Meeting is adjourned. Bye bye.